Good morning. We're so glad you've joined us. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. Not a cloud in the sky, blue. Oh, what a wonderful Sabbath day indeed. Well, we're here in lesson two now, the quarter. And uh, a moment of destiny. Destiny is kind of the final, the final moment in one's life. To some degree, some people think destiny is a life path that you're destined to take. But destiny, I think, at least from my perspective, is where you end up, is your destiny. And the memory text that goes with this is one of the longer ones we've seen in a while. But before we get into that, let's pray. Dear Jesus, as we look at uh, Revelation that you gave to John so many years ago on the island of Patmos, has broken down more specifically in the years afterward in verses and chapters, Look at Revelation 14 and what that has means for us today, as it did to the Christians of years ago, too. May your Holy Spirit enlighten our minds and open a quicked, quicked heart that we may indeed accept your calling to us today. You're reaching out to us, saying, It's time. I'm ready to reap. Are you ready to be part of my gathering in? It is our choice, Lord. I mean through the coaxing and wooing of the Holy Spirit, be drawn to you, that we may draw others to you as you live your life out through us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So getting to that long memory text, Revelation 14, 14, and 15, uh, our quarterly, for some reason, wants the news. What, you want to say something here? No, no. You look at me like, yeah, yeah, you're just rambling on Oh, there. go for it. All right. Just to be sure I wasn't, you know, strep- stepping over some bounds here. That, Yeah, you fellas know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his head on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. You know, I know I've shared this with you before, but Revelation, especially in the uh, last cry, the three angels' message and so forth, there's always an angel with a loud voice. And one of the Maxwell boys, either Graham or Malcolm, was once asked, well, you know, what's your, as a young person, how do you, uh, what do you think about Revelation and all the calamities and all the callings and all the warnings in the book of Revelation? And he said, not to be funny, but quite straightforward and honest, I guess perhaps only as a British raised young man would say, they must be hard of hearing there. Everyone speaks in a loud voice. Heaven must be a noisy place. Well, I think that loud voice as actually mean it's one to get one's attention. We teachers use a loud voice often. Well, I think it was more about the power of the voice. And <clears throat> you know, that that putting putting the information out there so that everybody will hear, so that it is it is an acceptable way to understand the information. And you know, when we look at this idea, the, this lesson is truly about, are we choosing Christ? Are we surrendering to him? Are we obeying him? So that in the final crisis, we will know what to do. We will know who, in whom we believe. Not only in whom we believe, but whom we've chosen to follow. Yeah. Um, but you know... In this world, if you don't choose to follow God, you're automatically following Satan because that is our human destiny. It's a choice. If we're not active, it's going to be active the other way. We can call it passive, but it's not passive. Because no, it's an automatic. Inactivity <laughs> is passive. It's is an automatic. An automatic. No, yeah. the, in the three angels' message, of course, their messages of mercy, their messages of of calling a man away from trusting in our own self-righteousness and truly looking to Christ to be justified and sanctified so that at the end, when he does come the second time, either living righteous or dead righteous can be glorified. 
So it's a three-pronged message that we're looking at in Revelation 14. There's other texts that go along with it as well today as we'll be reading yeah. the lesson. And it's interesting in this lesson, um, in this part <clears> of it, <throat> it, the voice is talking to the Son of Man, saying, thrust your sickle in and reap. It isn't our job. It's God's job. Well, no, he's told us, work the field, plant the seed, I'll harvest. Yes. Right. And the growing and, and the harvesting is really about God engaging with us. And that's just it. We can't harvest because we don't know the time to harvest. Yeah. The angel comes out and tells them it's time to harvest for it is ripe. Yeah. Even experienced farmers need to know where they're shipping and how they're shipping nowadays, especially, and to know when to reap. Now, I would say that because we have markets from all over the world, perhaps the reaping is not weighted to the fullness of the fruit or grain like it was in days of yore, but still it makes a big difference. When we were living out in Ventura County, we had a retired uh, school administrator and his wife, a retired nurse, who did what they called senior gleaning in the fields. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, and I would have been in my mid to late 30s at the time, I tasted fresh, truly fresh, fully ripened broccoli. Oh my goodness, it tastes like nothing you buy in the stores, nothing. It was just amazing. And, I'm th and, and the same was true earlier where I had truly tree-ripened apples from Washington. For the first time in my life, uh, around age 30, I had a true golden delicious apple that tasted like a, a delicious apple as opposed to a green apple. And it was golden. Oh my goodness. I've never had stuff like it because I've never had tree, fully tree-ripened fruit or truly fully ripened broccoli. But that's true with the grains, with other things. And this was all symbolic the people knew being an agrarian society exactly what jesus was talking about yeah well our eternal choices is sunday's lessons and our choices that we make now do have eternal consequences because they establish our habits which establishes our character and i'm just rolling with this thing today stop snickering at me dear <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Sometimes he has more words to use because he hasn't used them enough. Sometimes I do. So if we look at Matthew 24, 14, uh, this is a familiar text. Um, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I Often we forget that as a testimony to all nations. The gospel is our testimony to all nations. Um, it's not an obligation that's filled. And that's an important um, aspect of it. So then when we go to Revelation 14, if you go to 14.6, whoops, I'm in the wrong place. Um, Revelation 14, 6, um, you see the same kind of thing. Um, then I saw an angel in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tongue, and people. And he said, you know, fear God, give him glory. For the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of the water. So, again, looking at that eternal choice, we have a part to play in helping the world know what those eternal choices are. It is through our testimony that they find out about God and what God wants for them. So this week, as you all are probably well aware, this Sunday, this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday. So this week is often called the Passion Week or the Passion of Christ. That started with Palm Sunday this last Sunday and went through. So with my students this year, it's working out so well that I'm going through the Desire of Ages in those last, the last week of Christ's life leading up to his crucifixion. And I think one thing that struck me, and hopefully I got them to get it too, was that 
This was Jesus' last warning for his death. His last call to repent to the Pharisees, to the leaders who so adamantly opposed him because really because of his popularity, the fact he was stealing stealing their thunder, so to speak. And because it was Passover week anyway, there were many, many more people in Jerusalem. And the Desire of Ages repeatedly says there are great throngs following Jesus wherever he went to be healed, to be listened to his preaching, to, 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 to pay attention and so forth. But because Jesus was... able to always answer with a very piercing answer and a very deep answer so that even the people to whom he spoke would understand through parable and story, yet the priests and scribes and others would as well, that they needed to walk the walk, not just walk the talk. They said one thing and did another. This is where he refers to them as whitewashed sepulchers. They look great on the outside, but inside, hmm, what's in the sepulchers? They knew well what it was. And their choices, little by little, is what determines their eternal destiny because it determines one's character. When we um, look at the Bible texts that are, are here, it, the emphasis is it must go to all the world. And as I thought about this, I thought, wow... You know, we often say, um, you know, it's got to go to all the world. But do we really think about what that means? Um, Sometimes we think, oh, it's got to be in the jungles of India and the, you know, savanna of Africa and in the, you know. The mountains of the Andes and Himalayas. Yeah, whatever. We look at big places far away. But I think one of the things that came through to me this week is to all the world is my world. I'm responsible to to represent, to share, to glorify God in my world. And if everyone does that, the gospel will go to the entire world. We know that, you know, when you when you go, you know, out from me to two people and then that person does two people and it keeps going, right? It, it's bigger and bigger until you have covered the world. Well, strictly by numbers, doing two people at a time, one person to two and no one falls away. 23 years to reach 4 billion people. Well, we're a bit more than 4 billion now. We're closer to 7 billion. And we're but far from the... But 23 years, too. Yes, well, of course, from the disciples especially. But the thing is, it's the choices that we make. The lesson points out that it's the small choices. It's those choices that establish the habits. Because we were created to do. And as we do, a memory is formed in the muscles. It's not just a memory in the brain, in the cognitions, but it's also in the muscles. And that's why athletes and performers, whether they're musical performers or or uh, kinesthetic performers, dancers, they practice. So the moves, they don't need to think about whether it's playing a keyboard or an instrument or a violin or even vocal singing. It becomes a habit. You don't need to think about it. Think about when you were first driving. How many of you learned how to drive a stick shift? Well, did you just pop that car in first gear and away you went? No, you probably jackrabbited and stalled the engine and of course not, because she lived on a farm and had to work on tractors all the time with clutches and things. But in any case, <laughs> it was it's not just a way you go. You had to practice at it, and it became habitual. Mm-hmm. My dad, at one point in time, was driving a car with a, with a manual transmission uh, for his pretty much regular mode of transportation. And then on a family vacation, of course, the car that we used to pull the boat didn't have a clutch. So we're exiting on Harvey Drive after a long vacation, kind of dozing in the back. And all of a sudden we urge the brakes just slam on and thank goodness, thank God we didn't jackknife. 
Dad thought he was pushing in the clutch to downshift coming off the exit because he was just an automatic. He wasn't actually thinking. That's how our bodies work. That's how God created them to work. So as we do little choices, it's they become bigger choices because the littler one was easy to make, so the next one's even easier to make, and they become habits, and they can become habits of thought as well. We need to be careful that we are indeed choosing Always, always choosing the path that Jesus has laid out for us. And that can be challenging. <laughs> now, yeah, I get the signal. Um, if we're thinking about choices and those eternal choices, rarely do we think, is what I'm eating an eternal choice? Is what I'm reading an eternal choice? Is what I'm watching an eternal choice? Because we don't look at choices that way. I was listening to a psychologist. It was it was on, you know, people who are struggling with me mental health. And I I hear all the time people, oh, you know, I got to take care of my mental health, my mental health. And I'm like, just get on your knees, and your mental health improves. But this woman was talking about. If you're struggling, you know, just getting going. She said, get out of bed, make your bed. Because you've done one right choice. And when you make one right choice, don't hit the snooze button. Don't <laughs> don't um, say, oh, I'll get up in five minutes. Don't just get out of bed, make your bed. Once your bed's made, you've done two right things. You haven't hit snooze and you haven't, you know, you've made your bed. Then get your day going. Take your shower. Get yourself ready. Even if you have no place to go, it will start you on a path of making right choices for the day. And I thought about how often, um, you know, when we look at Revelation 22, um, Jesus talks about, um, you know, the people, how you are now is how you'll be in heaven. But oh, glorified. But glorified. But, but the choices you're making... So if we look at it's it your character. with um, Revelation 22, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So as we're looking at that idea, we need to make good choices. We need to look at our choices and ask ourselves, is this a choice? That it's going to put me on a path of good choices today. But that statement in Revelation 22 is the last statement made in heaven before Jesus comes back, I believe. I'm yes. i over here to, to verify but that. But it is about... And that's true, because your character is set and sealed at that point in time, and it's too late. Everything is done, because chapter 22, verse 12 of Revelation says, Behold, I, I am coming soon. I shall bring my wages and my rewards with me to repay and to render to each one just what his own actions and his own work merit. Actions become our, our habits. Our habits become our character. And it's our character that's the only thing we're taking from this earth to heaven. And if our character is not that of Jesus, we won't be taking anything to heaven. So, you know, I love, I love the last, next to the last, well, the, actually the last sentence, the last three sentences on the end of, of Sunday's lesson. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. Skip a bit. Our daily lives determine our destiny. That change that, that happens, the transformation that happens at the second coming is not one of character. It's one of mortality. And it's one of intended glory to represent God, to fully be in God's image once again. How does God shape our characters? Well, by enabling us to make the right choices. But we have to ask him to help us do that because we don't, we normally want to make the right choices. How many of you choose a stick of celery over a piece of pie or cake? Depends on if it has peanut butter. <laughs> okay. You get my point, though. You know, celery is a lot healthier for you than that piece of pie or piece of cake. But in any case, you know, and what then can we do to be more 
fully to more fully allow the Holy Spirit to transform us to be like Jesus. That's the kicker. There are things we have to do. And wh one thing we can do, like we said, is get on your knees. Get on your knees. So when we look at Monday's lesson, Monday's lesson looks at the Son of Man returning. And, you know, the, the term Son of Man was a, a term that Jesus referred to himself. Oh, son of Man. I'm the Son yes, of Man. Yes, but it was, he was also referred to, the Messiah was also referred to Son of Man much earlier in, in, in yeah. the scriptures as well. But he used it to talk about himself. And basically, if we look at this, um, you know, in, in Revelation... If you go to Revelation that's 14, part 14, of our memory verse. Yeah, the then week. we've got the Son of Man, right? The cloud, the man, um, son of man sitting on the white cloud. So that concept of the Son of Man, um, recognizing that it's a part of prophecy, it's going to carry on. It's not going to stop. Um, son of Man, Son of Man. So we know who's being talked about. And just to know, just to help you know if you. Um, if you're following along or, or this is something new to you too, the lesson points out that the term Son of Man just in the New Testament, Jesus uses it to refer to himself more than 82 times. That's quite a number of times if you think about it. 82 in just the New, in the New Testament. In, in fact, it says in, in the Gospels. So just the first four books of the New Testament. 82 times. That's a pretty strong reference. Well, and the the key to that is the fact that it it acknowledges his humanity, um, what he gave up in heaven, so that he could come and fulfill the law be and part, fulfill prophecy to be the second Adam. As I, that term, that term, may, I don't know if that term is unique to Adventism or not. Um, I'm I think Paul refers to the first Adam of the first man and, and moves on into. That, what, that Jesus, then the Messiah, does in the, in the replacement of the first man being the son of man and the second Adam, so to speak. And the Savior, then being the son of man, can fully understand our experiences and understand our temptations. And be, he went through the same ones right up to his final, it is finished statement. He was tempted far beyond any of us ever have or will be. And through his connection with God, stayed perfect. One of us, but yet perfect. So looking at a couple of the Bible texts here. Um, Matthew 16, 27. Um, For the Son of Man is to come and with his angels in the glory of the Father, and he will repay every man for what he has done. Then we go on to Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 says, um, in verse 27, um, it says, and 27 and 30, I should say. Okay, 27 says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will become the Son of Man. In other words, Every, every place from east to west will see him. And we know that that's God's omnipresence, his ability to be everywhere well, we, at all we, moments. We, we believe it is. Anyway. We don't know. Well, that's what it says. So it will be the coming of man. From, comes from the east and shines as far as the west. Meaning, it's you, whether you go east or west, he's going to be there. Sure. Well, that's what it says. Well, dear, it also could mean that as the earth turns, everyone will see No, them. it doesn't say as the earth turns. It says so far. And lightning is there instantly. So, then we go on to Matthew 30. And 30 says... Ma oh, verse 30, yes. Not the chapter Then 30, will appear the sign. Yeah. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And that's similar to what Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32 say as well. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, his majesty and splendor, all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. 
All nations shall be gathered before him. See, they're being gathered before him. And they will, and he will separate the people from them, from as one another, as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. So the nations are being gathered, and they all will see him at that point, because they're all gathered. And again, this was the parable of the, of the shepherd. And, but it, it was for the second coming of how the kingdom of God was going to be established. So in those passages, Jesus is referred to the son, as the Son of Man, with, coming with, in glory with his angels. The people who are following him are, on, are separated out from those who are not. And destiny is, is done. The nations have been declared for eternity, whether they are holy nations following God or evil nations following Satan. And of course, those, it, the parable ends with those who did not know, that Jesus did not know, it's being thrown out into utter darkness with his great waiting and gnashing of teeth. And that was a significant phrase for the people of the day because they understood what that was with the professional mourners and so forth that they hired. As we continue on, I think we're moving to Tuesday. Yep. The heavenly judgment is taking place. What goes on there again? And again, we see one like the Son of Man sitting on a white cloud in that heavenly judgment. Um, when Jesus ascended to heaven, Luke tells us in Acts 9, uh, 1 9, rather, that the disciples stood up, gazed up, looking up into heaven. And they watched as Jesus was taken up in a cloud. Yeah. And a promise was given at that point in time. Of course. And it says. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So knowing that he will descend, knowing that he is coming for us, that's how we'll know. And one of the things, you know, I remember is that a young person, we had a week of prayer speaker come and go on and on about, you know, what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. And, you know, I struggled a little bit because, quite honestly, um, you know, I had been told that, you know, no one knows the hour and no one knows exactly what's going to happen. And, and well, We know what's going to happen. We just know the time. Well, the Bible tells us very well what's going to happen. I know, but we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, what it's going to be like. Beyond our wildest imagination. Well, exactly. I have not seen or you heard. And that concept, it just bugged me a little bit. Um, but as I thought about it over the years, how do we know that it's Jesus coming? And I got to thinking about the parable of the Good Shepherd and how in the Good Shepherd, um, his Jesus, sheep know his name. They know his name and they know his voice. And, I meant voice, not name. He knows our name, and we know his voice. And I was thinking, you know, in the end, we know Satan's going to do all kinds of things to try to... Um, deceive the deceive very elect. Deceive people, you know. And um, this must be, you know, a sign. This must be a sign. But if we know God's voice, we'll be able to discern that. But to know a voice... We have to know that person. We have to have listened to God's voice. So if we look at Tuesday's lesson and we look at um, Daniel and we look at what Daniel says. So this is going to be Daniel 7 where we start. Yeah. And Daniel is, you know, Daniel's not necessarily an easy book to deal with. Um, and sometimes when we're looking at um, Daniel, we think, oh, well, I can never understand all of the things. But if you go to ver uh, chapter 7 and you go okay. to um, verse 9, verse where nine it starts. Um, and it and it basically begins to talk about... Um, as I looked, um, I kept looking until thrones were placed for the ascent for the assessors with the judge. 
And the Ancient of Days, God, the Eternal Father, took his seat, whose garment, so now we have a description of God, whose garment was white as snow, and hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, with uh, its wheels were burning fire. Shall I continue? Sure, why not? Ten. Verse ten. A stream of fire came forth before him. Thousands, a thousand thousands ministered to him. And ten thousand times ten thousand rose up and stood before him. The judge was seated, the court was in session, and the books were opened. So go to thirteen. Thirteen. And I, uh, I saw in the, in the night visions, and behold, on the cloud of the heavens came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Verse 14 and there was and there was given him the messiah dominion and glory over, and kingdom that all people nation and languages should serve him his dominion is everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed so looking at that idea <clears throat> We now get a picture of the judgment. What is that courtroom looking like? A lot of to, fire there. Well, yes, but we're also, and white hair. Um, but more than that, we're looking at a place uh, that is solemn, but it's already figured out. This isn't a lawyer coming in trying to prove himself. This is a lawyer coming in, or an advocate, coming in with dominion, with power. Um, if you are looking through that, um, everlasting dominion. Wow, that's pretty pretty amazing. Glory, right? It's an everlasting dominion. God at, at Calvary had everlasting dominion, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. All right. A little slow on the uptake there. Yeah. I was looking um, further on in Daniel to see if it actually uh, gave indi indication of just how, where that kingdom came from and how it was set up. But, but Daniel ha sees those visions and it, it, it's majestic. It's huge. Thousands of thousands of thousands. 10,000 of times 10,000. That's a pretty big number. You know, the Babylonians understood the um, numeric system with, with the base 10, that what this number is meant. And those are very large numbers. You know, it's like the 70 times 7. It's just a big number. You don't forgive someone 144 times and say, okay, I'm done forgiving you. It's 499, 449, whatever it is. I, 449, maybe, I don't know. But the fact that it was a big number, it was a big number to those to those fishermen, and yeah, yeah, and so and who thinks they need to forgive that many times? We hope we learn our lesson either on their part or our part, one of the two. Um, so the question at the end: Your whole life will come under scrutiny before God. I read that and I thought. Now notice it says. It'll come before uh, scrutiny before God, not God will scrutinize it. Okay. Now but that's interesting way, to think about. No, that's interesting to think about. But I'm not going to go there at this point in time. It's probably good, another lesson. Because I want to be able to say this. So good. say it. When our life comes under scrutiny, we know that if we have an active relationship with Jesus Christ. We will have asked forgiveness for our sins. Therefore, our life coming under scrutiny is not frightening. Because Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus forgives, Jesus saves, Jesus forgives. That's what our lives will be under scrutiny. It will be all about Jesus and nothing about us. So it is not a terrifying time. 
And Romans 8.1, of course, is that famous text. Um, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who um, love God, right, and are called according to his work. So recognizing that at this, this scene that is set up here, it's really about, oh, Jesus forgave that. Oh, and, but there's, it's not even going to say what it is. It's just forgiven. Forgiven, forgiven. Heavenly white out. Yes. And it's not going to, and I was thinking about that this week and I thought, I'm so thankful that God forgives my sins. I am so thankful that he forgives when I speak without thinking. So thankful he forgives when I'm selfishly doing something instead of thinking about someone else. So as I look at that idea, if our lives are truly forgiven, if we have sought him with all our heart, there's no problem. No problem. It's kind of like going to court with no evidence against you. You're going to, no matter how good the lawyer might be, you're going to be vindicated because there's no condemning evidence. Yeah. Wednesday's lesson is the victor's crown. You know, I always thought of the crowns in heaven as being kingly crowns, you know, like the Queen of England, or well, excuse me, the King of England that now wears lots of jewels and gems and, and comfortable fur around it to make a sop on your head. But the lesson doesn't say that's what the crown is like. The, the lesson very specifically talks about the kind of crown that the victors have. And as our memory verse states that the Son of Man has on his head a golden crown, that crown, the lesson points out, was, is the Greek word uh, Stephanos. And it means the victor's crown, someone who has won a contest. What did the Greeks get? They got a laurel wreath. Okay, but this now is a gold crown. And it emphasizes the fact that it's a crown of honor, a crown of, crown of glory, and a crown of, crown of victory. And that is for those also to whom, who are overcomers. They also will receive that crown of victory. And it shows the fact, in this case, Lessa points out, how as a man, he received a crown of thorns and great mockery to those who... Who rejected him and ridiculed him and did horrible things to Jesus before he died on the cross. But now he comes with a crown of victory, a crown of glory and a crown of honor. We get that crown as well. So the Revelation 14, 15 is just part of our memory text where yes. he um, is told, um, you know, reach in with your sickle and harvest. And then if we look at Mar uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29, again, this is the parable that Jesus tells and connecting information. Um, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise um, night and day and the seed should sprout and grow. He knows not how the earth produces of itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. Oh my, it's not come be thankful people come. Anyway, <laughs> but when, sorry, it just was the, the song. See what pops out of her mouth. <laughs> and the grain is ripe at once. He puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. When we look at those two things, what is it about the ripening harvest? Again, this germinating idea of putting the seed out there, it will automatically happen. God doesn't, we don't have to do anything but sow. You know, in fact, our joke at our house when we were little was if we didn't take the... Um, the weeds out of the garden, this was my dad's philosophy, then the seeds from that weed will blow through the garden and we'll have to do more. So, of course, 
we were very serious about getting rid of the weeds because we didn't want any seeds blowing around. Because Dad said it doesn't take anything for it to grow out and, of the ground. And didn't you also take those weed that you picked and went to, to burn, the burn pile? Yeah, went to yeah. burn them so they the seed could not germinate. Yeah. So even if it did get away, the seed grows. It's not making noise. It's just growing. It's doing what. And I was thinking that if we are representing God in the way that we should, spreading the gospel, the automatic response of the seeds is to grow. Sometimes we think, oh, we could get more people if we did this, or we could get more people if we did this, when in fact, all we have to do is scatter the seed. However that is, whether it's in a program, whether it's in a conversation, whether it's in a pamphlet, whether it's in a phone call, whatever way we scatter the seeds, that's, it's going to grow. The response will be an automatic growth because Jesus is so compelling. I was listening to a testimony um, this week of, of a man who had had um you know with the the um revivals that are coming around LA this last weekend um this man said i have spent the last 15 years of my life he wasn't that old um believing in satanism you oh, know wow. worshiping doing and i went by and there were these young people and they were singing praises to God and, and talking to people about God and what he could do for their lives. And he said, I went over to, to attack them. And he said, I hit a wall. And I was coming with all the evil force. And it pushed me back so fast. And he said, all of a sudden, my heart was overcome with the Spirit of God. And I realized, for the first time, my heart was human. And I went to them, and I asked for prayer. And asked for them to pray for me, to be converted. And I thought, just, you know... <laughs> Just that, that impetus is so overpowering. We don't recognize, you know, we think, oh, well, we're going to do our preaching. And then after a little while, the people, God is compelling. And it's instant if we're putting him forth in front rather than saying, oh, it's about us and God's blessing us top down no it let it be god's force out of us it's it's exciting it talks about the sanctification of the people and what that is you know ellen white says it's the job of a lifetime right what do we need to do how do we need to do that if you have a regular quarterly or even a teacher's quarterly at the end of the week's lesson, there is always a little story called Inside Story. And this week, they chose to tell a story that happened in the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. They've been having Christian, non-Christian, Muslim re revolts, uprisings, whatever you want to call it, for more than five decades um, of, of, of modern times, so to speak. And then how uh, Adventist World Radio was able to broadcast specifically to that area. It's an amazing story, like Tracy was just talking about, of, of perhaps not, not, um, what do you call it? revival, but it's the transforming power of God on people's lives. Yeah. If you have the quarterly and haven't read it, do so, do so. Well, Thursday's lesson, Every Seed Produces a Harvest. This is exactly what Tracy was talking about earlier. The seed doesn't know that it's growing. It just does what God intended it to do. And 
Yes, every seed produces a harvest. It's either a harvest of full grain or a harvest of, of weed. The seed's going to grow. Gets enough water, gets in the soil. The, the seed even knows if you plant a seed with the growing part down and you still can see the seed, it grows down and then it knows to come up and grow correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists have tried to figure out, is, is it a heat thing? Is it a light thing? Is it, you know, what is it exactly what's in the ground there? But that's what the seed does and they planted them intentionally upside down to see what would happen. It starts to grow down, but it knows to turn and come up to the soil surface and grow beyond it. You know, um, what we choose to do is where we end up. Kind of in the, in the middle portion of Thursday's lesson, the short little paragraph, that really puts it all in a very, very small capsule. What more could God do than than he did on the cross. There's nothing more gr grace can do to redeem those who have repeatedly rejected the Holy Spirit. Coming to, come to Calvary, seeing, seeing the dying Savior, we're, we're instructed to do us well to, to contemplate the last hours of Jesus' life for an hour a day, for an hour of day, you know? Um, where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be also, or where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also, whatever the case might be in that, that verse. And where our mind is, and where our heart is, recognizing the need that we have, this is at different times compelling in different ways. Sometimes it's groveling and, and begging forgiveness because of how remorseful we feel. And sometimes it's a longing that we have for more. And as I was looking at this um, section, uh, looking at Hebrews 5.14, um, basically when you, when you look at this, but solid food is for the mature. It talks about milk for babies, but you know, as you mature, you want solid food for those who have their faculties trained by practice to distinguish good and evil. God has asked us to find the difference. And if you look, it's so obvious. I, all my life, um, you know, I've been told, you know, be careful, the wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, watch out because Satan's trying to trick you. But man, if you look at what's out there on the internet, what people are saying, what's out there, no longer is evil trying to disguise itself. It's coming right out <laughs> and saying um, this last um, this last carnival in Brazil, this last Mardi Gras in New Orleans, what's that happening? And around. It's oh, it's today. Week, yeah. That's right. And looking today. at this today. week, um, it was this. Yes, they, Wednesday. the 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 floats, the the people. It's just evil. It's literally to Satan, to Baal, to many of these ancient gods. There's a a new um, statue kind of, I don't know, art they call it. In, that was placed in New York um, Grand Central. Oh, the park. Big park. Anyway, Central Park. Central Park. And it's evil. It's literally got four sides, and each one of them represent a different um, evil satanic god. And the symbols that are on it are extreme hmm. in evil old you know, pulling old and they're like, oh, this author, you know, this sculptor, you know, has made it looking at the world and, you know, bringing it, put it together. Yeah, evil, just flat out evil. And I, I thought, you know, so many times, you know, when we were little and we heard fairy tales and there's a fairy godmother and that's kind of a happy little whatever, right? 
or we think about Santa and his elves, and that's kind of a little happy thing. But now evil is just plain evil, and much of it is even being celebrated. And so I was, I was looking at, it's becoming very apparent, God, God is grace, compassion, mercy, love. And evil is greed and lust and jealousy and hatred by their works, by their actions, by their thoughts. We will know. And that's, that's the produced harvest that we can look at and recognize what is good and what is evil. And just like the Secret Service men and women study the real currency to detect the fake currency, the counterfeit, we too, if we study the real, the right, the Bible, we'll know. Exactly. Because exactly. we will know the real deal and the false will be evident, yeah. very evident. Yeah. One of our friends at one of our churches that we we're in as we sojourned away from California or away to the LA area. Like we actually away, got we a counterfeit twenty dollar bill from her bank in the ATM machine. And as she showed it to us, it was like, Well yeah, look at it. It doesn't even look like the twenty dollar bill is supposed to look like. It really looked bad. Uh, the, the the image was small, the green was the wrong kind of green, but uh, she almost got in trouble with the police for that. Um, it is though that it, you know, it, 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 like Tracy said, the, the lesson points out that it's subtle and imperceptible and almost unnoticeable yeah. at first, but it's not, it's yeah. out there and it's big and it is the lion going about roaring, yeah. destroying all he can. Yeah. So we've always heard the concept of by beholding, we become changed. And um, the great controversy, Ellen White is quoted as saying, the mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. In this day and age, our phones, how much time do we spend on them? Oh, I'm waiting for somebody. Instead of maybe letting our minds elevate, we're like mindless, you know, letting it go. It becomes assimilated to that which, this is the mind, that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. If there is a compelling message from this lesson, it is that. That the gradual, it's it just, we train our minds the way we want them to go. And it is a choice, a daily choice. And that's what we are called to make, a daily choice for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, your blessings. Thank you that you have given us a message. It's clear. We could easily see the difference between good and evil if we talk about it and if we study about it and if we know about it. But when we're just not paying attention, that's where evil overcomes. So help us to pay attention. Help us to be mindful. Soften our hearts so that, that we, will, we will make choices that are positive so that we can go home with you because that's what we want more than anything, to go and be forever with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do have a blessed week. And this coming lesson, is one I think you'll find particularly enjoyable. Until we see each other again, hopefully at church, in person, have a good day. Have a wonderful Sabbath and a great week.